Vice Chancellor, distinguished colleagues, thank you for the invitation to deliver the Professor M. B. Butch Memorial Lecture in these very turbulent times. My topic today is Emerging Landscape of Higher Education, Global Trends. It's appropriate also that Professor Mukhopadhyay, a former student of Professor Butch, is chairing this session. It's an honor to dedicate this lecture to Professor Butch, the founder director of the Center of Advanced Study in Education. His vision and leadership shaped the center into a premier national organization that has made several invaluable contributions to the development of education in India. My former colleague, Professor Mohan Menon, who knew him, recalls that he was an institution builder, motivator, mentor, and visionary. The research he initiated at Case revitalized teacher education in India and other Asian countries. Professor Butch edited the first series of surveys of research in education, which was subsequently taken up by the NCERT. An exemplary researcher and scholar, Professor Butch believed that, and I quote, research has value only when its results influence or promote action, either directly or indirectly, unquote. He believed that research should influence policy, program, and practice with clear links between how educational systems can contribute to national development. These ideas resonate very well with us at the Commonwealth of Learning. As you know, Paul is an intergovernmental organization established by Commonwealth heads of government with headquarters in Canada. Our mission is to help member states and institutions to use distance learning and technologies for expanding access to education and training. India is an important member of COL, and we are very grateful for its consistent financial and intellectual support. In this presentation, I will first look at the impact of COVID-19 on higher education, and then on why higher education is even more important than ever before. I will then focus on the emerging landscape of higher education and some of the international developments that have helped teachers and students find creative solutions to the challenges of this time. This will lead to a reflection on the implications for universities and how we can build on the momentum generated now to take the road ahead into a better post-COVID world. As we all know, COVID-19 has caused the biggest disruption of education in human history, where over 95% students at all levels worldwide were impacted. The closure of campuses affected more than 220 million higher education students globally. Most institutions had to pivot to emergency remote teaching, and many did not have adequate technology infrastructure. The mobility of international students plummeted, with countries losing large revenues from student fees. Budget cuts were imposed by governments. Research, reliant on practical work and external collaborations, suffered the most. Over 63 million teachers were impacted by the pandemic. Data from the rich OECD countries indicates that only 60% of teachers had some training in ICTs, and yet teachers rose to the occasion. A survey conducted in Europe found that most teachers live-streamed lectures synchronously, and a large number of teachers also used asynchronous approaches 
by sending pre-recorded videos and audio lectures. A study in the US and Canada revealed that over 50% of the teachers required help with supporting remote students. They needed access to digital materials and wanted assistance with technology use. I don't think the situation was much different in the developing Commonwealth. Students too suffered in various ways and half of them felt that their performance had declined. Many faced challenges relating to technology tools and connectivity and most felt an impact on their psychological well-being. Now regarding technology, in a survey conducted at Stanford University, 16% of the undergraduate students reported not having access to the internet for half the time, and this is a rich university, and 60% of the students from low-income homes did not have a private space for study. Similarly, survey conducted at the University of Hyderabad, again a well-endowed institution, indicated that students had issues with connectivity, the costs of data, and inability to access online classes. The vulnerable are the most impacted in crisis situations, especially those on the other side of the digital divide. Existing inequalities were further exacerbated. The pandemic has deepened the existing learning crisis. A study in the Netherlands records a learning loss of about three percentile points with higher losses among students from less educated homes. But was it really a complete learning loss? It is true that learning was indeed lost as the curriculum could not be covered because of the disruptions. As some suggest, the term learning loss introduces a deficit mindset that demotivates the learners and doesn't appreciate the efforts that teachers put in. Amidst this learning loss was actually a learning gain where over and above the curriculum, both teachers and learners learned to be resilient, managed their time better, acquired basic computer skills to learn, and collaborated on various social media platforms. All these are relevant skills that will help students be better prepared for the future. Another silver lining was the global acceptance of distance and online learning. It would have taken years of advocacy to achieve the overnight transition to remote learning that we've seen in the last 18 months. A recent study in the UK found that the majority of higher education students rated the quality of online learning as excellent. But as we know, crisis generates creativity and you've seen the change in perception. We've seen more flexible and blended approaches being implemented to address the needs of different constituencies. So is this perhaps the moment when the ugly duckling of distance education transforms into a beautiful swan? Can distance education help us increase access to quality higher education? Globally, we have seen a steady rise in gross enrollment ratios in tertiary education from 25% to an average of nearly 40%. Similarly, there has been a gradual increase in the gross enrollment ratios of tertiary education in South Asia since 2005. And the averages now stand currently at 25%. But it's still well below the 40% that is needed for countries to achieve sustainable economic development. 
convinced that higher education leads to higher earnings and social mobility. Policymakers have invested in this sector. Both developed and developing countries such as South Korea, Chile and the United Kingdom have very high gross enrollment ratios and the demand for degrees continues to grow worldwide. Higher levels of education usually translate into better employment opportunities and higher earnings. Among tertiary educated adults, the relative earning advantages increase with the level of tertiary education. On average across OECD countries, those with masters, doctoral or equivalent degrees earn twice as much as those with lower qualifications. In addition to individual benefits, higher education contributes to higher social returns on investment. A World Bank report shows that the private rate of return on higher education ranges from 12 to 26 percent, while the social return on investment ranges from anywhere between 9 to 13 percent amongst low and middle income and even higher income countries. And of course, let's note here that countries with low per capita income have highest private returns on investment, as well as the highest social returns on investment in higher education. Makes sense to invest in higher education. Now in India, the gross enrollment ratio is about 27% with women's participation marginally higher than that of men. About 11% of all enrollments in higher education are in the distance learning programs, again with the substantial participation of women. As the National Education Policy India states, increased access, equity and inclusion in higher education will be achieved through online education and open and distance learning. And of course, the national target is 50% gross enrollment ratios by 2035. The 19 open universities in the country are making a concrete contribution towards this goal. And this is very significant because as the Nobel laureates Stiglitz and Greenwald point out, what truly separates developed from less developed countries is not just a gap in resources or outputs, but a gap in knowledge. So investments in higher education can contribute to a learning society ready to face and address future disasters and challenges. During this pandemic, we have seen a wide range of developments in higher education and lifelong learning. One has been the phenomenal increase in massive open online course enrollments, not just in the global brands such as Coursera and FutureLearn, but also universities, which had previously hesitated to offer online courses, came forward to offer MOOCs especially for professional development. The Call Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative skilled and reskilled over 150,000 Commonwealth citizens in the last 18 months. The pandemic has also seen the second coming of video learning, where teachers made significant contributions, often reaching their students through mobile devices. Call's video on demand service brought quality content in low bandwidth contexts in the Pacific. Formal assessments and proctoring systems suffered major setbacks during the pandemic, where institutions adopted innovative approaches to build flexible models and make assessments more authentic. For example, the University of South Africa developed app-based assessments, 
Griffith University Australia used oral assessments for their business program. And India introduced open book exams at scale. Open educational resources again were in high demand as teachers looked for quality digital content. In a North American study conducted during the pandemic, 44% of administrators were positive about the faculty use of OER, while a quarter of teachers believed that OER could contribute significantly to teaching and learning. Another study conducted by the OER Foundation and Call uh, last May found that over 75% of the respondents expressed high demand for OER-based online courses. The mobility of international students plummeted with travel restrictions and the closure of borders. This led to new partnerships and the increased importance of hybrid models and branch campuses, providing an opportunity for students to experience internationalization at home. Several institutions, particularly in Europe, came up with innovative solutions to help students. They deferred the payment of fees and provided financial support for at-risk students and international students. The recent EDUCAUSE Horizon report sums up six new trends in higher education. The widening of the digital divide, increased use of hybrid learning models, demand for new skills, a focus on sustainable development, and a decrease in funding for higher education. Respondents were also asked to pick up top technology trends and practices. The results were not surprising, with artificial intelligence topping the list, followed by blended course models, learning analytics, and micro-credentials. OER and quality online learning were also considered very important. So to what extent are we integrating these technologies and approaches in our own practice? What implications do these developments have for higher education? We believe that these changes signal the need for reform in three key areas, curriculum, teaching and learning, and assessments. And the third is, of course, openness and flexibility. How can universities reform the curriculum to be more relevant to the needs of our times? In a study in the US, 36% of college graduates did not show any cognitive gains over four years of college. Half the employers surveyed said that they did not find qualified graduates to hire. This June, McKinsey released a report identifying 56 foundational skills that would help citizens prepare for the future of work and become more employable. The four dimensions include the cognitive, interpersonal skills, self-leadership, and digital skills. The future of work will depend on how people have employable skills, that is, individuals who can add value beyond what can be done by automated systems, that means they have empathy, who work efficiently in a digital environment, are digitally fluent, and can demonstrate resilience to adapt to the new ways of working and new occupations, that means open-minded. So to create a higher education system that is responsive to the market needs and future requirements, it is necessary to look at the different stages of the employability pathway in our universities and reimagine our policies and practices. Whatever path we adopt, let us ensure that our graduates leave 
are institutions with three literacies that will prepare them for the future. First, human literacy prepares students to perform jobs that only human beings can do. Human literacy will help them to make ethical choices, equip them for social engagement with others through effective communication. Second, data literacy is essential in a world driven by data. Learners must be able to find meaning in the flood of information around us. And third, technological literacy and fluency is essential if we are to understand machines and their uses. Learners must be able to deploy software and hardware in order to maximize their powers to achieve and create. If we can equip our learners with these three literacies, I think we will be preparing them for the uncertain futures that lie ahead. Developments in technology will continue to drive changes in the way we teach and learn. And technology adoption has been further accelerated due the, to the pandemic, as we well know. Artificial intelligence is being mainstreamed in education and intelligent tutoring systems use AI techniques to simulate one-to-one -one human tutoring, provide timely feedback, all without the presence of a human teacher. Machine learning helps to analyze and summarize the discussions in online courses so that a human tutor can guide the students towards fruitful collaboration and outcomes. A popular example of AI in education is a virtual teaching assistant that can offer personalized help to learners. Chatbots are already being deployed as fairly effective teaching assistants right from Georgia Tech in the US to the Open University of Malaysia. But these have also served to highlight the need for human teachers and social interaction. Since there's more emphasis on learning outcomes, we need to invest in learner support. And I think technology can help us to a large extent. 24 by seven online hubs and call centers, and many institutions are doing this, can be very helpful if run effectively. Learning analytics have helped to provide personalized learning and improvements in learning outcomes in many institutions. But as we increase our use of technology, we need to keep the human touch front and center. Assessments have been a challenge for many teachers. According to Professor Rose Luckin at the University College London, the stop and test assessments don't rigorously evaluate a student's understanding of a topic. AI-based assessment constantly provides feedback to learners, teachers, and parents about how the students learn, the support they need, and the progress they're making towards their learning goals. Micro-credentials have again come to the forefront and are leading to shorter just-in-time courses that can be taken at one's own pace or convenience. The credentials can also be transferred from one institution to another. And since we are no longer testing only knowledge, but also skills and competencies, we need new ways of assessing performance. Assessment has been a great challenge, as we know. And the University of South Africa used mobile-based assessments to reach those in the most remote shanties. Today, we have a vast resource of open content, or OER, that we can adopt or adapt according to our needs. More than 900 universities in the world are offering MOOCs. And in the past, it was open universities that we usually associated with achieving scale. Today, MOOCs are reaching millions. So how can we use these new technologies 
to provide flexible and open learning options to our students. India and several Asian countries have launched MOOC initiatives by allowing students to earn up to 40% of course credits towards their qualifications through MOOCs, India is leading in this field. India is also a leader in developing OER and has an OER policy in place since 2014. Call has shared some of the course materials available on the NPTEL platform with other Commonwealth countries. Blended and hybrid models provide opportunities for learning to those who cannot access purely online provision. Open and distance learning has always adopted a blended approach, keeping in mind the issues of social justice. The UGC has issued a concept note on blended learning in May this year and is seeking inputs from stakeholders, a great uh, initiative. India's new national education policy has elements of all these developments, multidisciplinary education that provides employable skills, flexible pathways for entry and exit, a focus on formative assessments, and an emphasis on integrating technology and investing in research. As you can see, there seems to be a close alignment between international and national priorities. Within this context, what does the road ahead look like? First, what kind of graduates are we developing? Are we producing lifelong learners who are employable in the changing job market? Do they have a positive mindset for working with others? And are they responsible global citizens? Second, what kind of institutional culture have we developed? Institutional cultures will depend a great deal on leadership and the extent to which we can motivate and inspire our staff and students to deliver. Institutional leaders must encourage a spirit of inquiry and a culture of research. So how can this be done? Third, are we developing innovators of the future? In their book, The Innovator's DNA, Dyer et al. identify innovation skills that can be learned. Questioning, observing, networking, and experimenting. How can we ensure that these skills are acquired and reinforced? The university management must develop enabling policies for mainstreaming distance and blended approaches while also investing in technology infrastructure and quality assurance. The quality of an institution was always measured by inputs, processes and outputs with student pass rates at the center. With rising youth unemployment, the employability of graduates will be a key indicator of quality. Management must also develop policies that specifically ensure that no one is left behind. Universities need to rethink the curriculum to make it more integrated with the world of work. Harnessing the potential of OER can be one way forward for skilling and reskilling our young people. More flexible and blended approaches can be implemented to address the needs of different constituencies. And creative ways of assessments and credentialing will be key. And of course, research will provide the evidence of the efficiency and effectiveness of these approaches. Both teachers and students will need support for making the transition to the new normal. Institutions will need to pay more attention 
to the well-being of their staff and students through expert counseling and guidance. We have all been through this prolonged crisis, and the only way forward is to look at the silver linings and benefit from the lessons learned. Let me close with Professor, what Professor Butch said, and I quote, every crisis is pregnant with an opportunity. Just look behind the crisis. Opportunity will smile at you. So in that spirit, let me thank you for your kind attention. Stay well and stay cheerful.